Uh, my name is Nicolas Quesada, and I'll be telling you about this work on quantum computational supremacy uh, by using high dimensional Gaussian boson sampling. This is work that we did at, at Sanadu with my colleagues Abhinav, Arthur, Trevor, Lars, Jonathan, Hao Yu, Ish, and also with our friends in Berlin, uh, Marcel, Marius, Jens, and Dominic, and also with Bill Pfefferman, who is in Chicago. So let me give you a broad context of, of what we want to study. And, and the bigger question here is related to, to a question that has been asked from the very first talk uh, today by Hansen, which is that is related to this uh, extended church Turing thesis, which asks, are there computations a quantum computer can do efficiently that a classical computer cannot? So we know that if we had a fault tolerant universal quantum computer, we can very easily dispute this claim or, or to say, actually, there are such computations. And an example of that is uh, factoring. So if you had a, a universal quantum computer, you could just run Shor's algorithm, get your prime numbers, and then you could actually find out the secrets of half of humanity or something like that. Uh, but since currently uh, we don't have uh, such universal quantum computer, we have to resort to, let's say, uh, simpler machines. And in that context, it was proposed by Arnold and Arkhipov that um, you can actually construct a very simple uh, linear optics machine in which you, you send bosons, you have them interfere, and you can show that this very simple machine can do a computation that a classical computer cannot do efficiently. So let me tell you a little bit more about what this boson sampling is, even though it has been mentioned multiple times today. Um, so the idea here is that you prepare some some non gauss some non-classical state of light that I'm gonna call psi here. You prepare m of those states, you send them into an interferometer, which I symbolize here by this block u, and then you just measure the photon number statistics that, that comes out. Um, in the original version introduced by Aronson and Arkhipov, the non-classical states that you send into the interferometer are the single photons, but then um, Hamilton and et al. showed that um, actually you can still get an interesting problem if instead of sending uh, single photons, you send uh, squeeze states. So let me look a little bit more carefully about what this Gaussian boson sampling is. So here is a so somewhat simpler version for four modes. Um, as before, we start by preparing vacuum, which uh, at optical frequencies at room temperature is very easy to do. Then this vacuum is squeezed, say, by a waveguide source or a ring source. Uh, and then once these squeeze states are prepared, they go into an interferometer, which before I symbolized by this U, but now here I'm actually telling you what's inside that, that box. And that interferometer is assembled by putting together a number of beam splitters that allow the light from the different modes to interfere. And finally, once all that interference has happened, uh, the light goes into photon number detectors here at the end. Um, and then what these photon number detectors will do is they will just, you know, count photons. Um, and that means in this context that they will produce some random string of, of integers, you know, like the first mode will collect one photon, the second one will collect two, the third one will collect three, and the last one maybe will not collect any, so it will just produce zero. Um, but now, now that I'm telling you what's inside the interferometer, one thing that is important to notice here is that for light of all the modes to be able to interfere, uh, if you want to have a, a universal interferometer, then the depth of the circuit, so the number of beam splitters that any of these modes has to traverse is equal or at least proportional to the number of modes present in the circuit. So, so you can see this, for instance, by following the trajectory of this third mode, you can see that it has to traverse one, two, three, four interferometers, and that's precisely the number of modes that we have. And that, as I'm going to tell you in a moment, is a problem. And it's a problem because we know that the loss is going to scale with, uh, with the depth of the circuit. And if that is the case, so if the loss is, is proportion, is, scales exponentially with the, with the size of the problem, with the number of modes, then one can show in this paper that, that I, I uh, collaborated with uh, how you, Daniel, and, and Raul, that if the loss is increasing exponentially with the size of the problem, then at least in the asymptotic limit, your problem becomes classically efficient to simulate. So you can actually write very simple, neat algorithms that allow you to generate samples of this lossy problem. And the main idea behind this is that if there is a lot of loss, 
then your lossy squeeze states somehow are very close to classical states of light for which sampling from the photonormal distribution is very easy. So summarize here, if we have a very, bit, a very deep circuit um, where we actually decompose the interferometer in terms of all these beam splitters that we can program, then eventually our, our system is gonna become efficiently similar. For so one way to get around this problem is to just give up programmability to say, I actually don't care about this. So you're just gonna print a big interferometer into a static uh, substrate, like uh, like uh, in the talk from Hansen early this morning. Um, but maybe potentially another way that you can try to do is to actually just have shallow circuits. So you could have a circuit where you have a lot of modes, but um, the depth of the circuit is, is very small. Uh, but as we show here, turns out that that will not work. So if you have a circuit where you have a lot of modes, but the, but you only have beam splitters or call interactions, then you're gonna run into the problem um, that that circuit is efficient to simulate. And that's because the, the adjacency matrix or the matrices that describe this problem are gonna be banded. And for those matrices, you can always find efficient algorithms to calculate the probability amplitudes or the probabilities that appear in the problem. So we're in a bit of a pickle now because on the one hand, if we want to have deep circuits with local interactions, then there's gonna be this uh, exponential accumulation of loss. And on the other hand, if we have shallow circuits with local interactions, then, um, then we know that we can efficiently simulate as, as we show in this work here. So to get around this and at the same time keep programmability, uh, we take inspiration from, from actually the, the world of superconducting qubits where they have this, um, this lattice of, of quantum systems, in their case, they will be superconducting qubits and they have local interactions, but those local interactions occur in a 2D world. And as I'm gonna show you in a second, when, when you have these local interactions in 2D, that actually implies non-local interactions when you unravel the circuit, when you write the circuit diagram. So, so let me show you how that works. So here I have on the left-hand side, uh, a circuit diagram and on the right-hand side, I have these dots that represents the modes and, and they're now embedded in this two dimensional space. So if I want to uh, start interacting these, these modes, what I can do is first couple uh, all, the, all the different columns. So I can do these this red gates, which in the case of, of uh, Gaussian boson sample will be beam splitters. And you can see that those on the left hand side in the circuit diagram correspond to local gates, correspond to nearest neighbor interactions. Then I can do the same for the next column. And again, what I get is just local interactions. But then now if I want to start coupling the different, um, the different rows, then what I can do is, well, couple them, but that's gonna correspond to interactions that when I unravel the circuit into a circuit diagram uh, are non-local. And then again, I can do this. And now I have a circuit that is 2D, but you can see clearly that when it's written as a circuit diagram, it involves non-local interactions. So in this case, um, as it turns out, this circuit is gonna be hard to simulate. So I'm gonna show you in a second, but more importantly, this circuit, which uh, originally was written in the context of superconducting qubits is actually also extremely easy to, well, it's somewhat easy to attain also in optics. And for that, what one needs are uh, optical loops. So now imagine here that I, I still have my nine modes and I represent them by the, by the purple um, shapes that you see in the in that optical step. And then what's gonna happen is, for instance, when the modes four and five meet in the box here, which represents a beam splitter, precisely that's gonna give you a beam splitter interaction which corresponds to say this gate here. And moreover, if now I want to generate entanglement that is long range, so to generate one of these gates couple, let's say one and four, what I can look at is that once this mode number four exits the loop, it's gonna come to this other second loop where the, where the first mode has been waiting for him. And they're gonna again uh, interfere in the second beam splitter, giving me access to these long range interactions that I actually want so that I can get around the issues that I, that I highlighted before. So to summarize, if we want to have um, a high dimensional structure in optics, what you need is, is just loops. And unlike in superconducting qubits, where you are literally constrained to the physical dimensions where you can print uh, the circuits in optics, 
if you have to if you want to have multiple dimensions the only thing that you need is to have more loops in particular here because we have two loops of the dimensions of, of time delays one and three then what we can what we're implementing is a two-dimensional circuit with lattice size three but we can obviously be more creative and now consider for example a circuit that has three loops of of delays one six and 36 so this allows me to now have three-dimensional lattice uh, in which each lattice dimension has dimension six. So in total, I'm going to have six to the power three modes, so 216 modes, which is a lot of modes. And then I can ask, for example, what is the type of unitary matrices that I can uh, generate by using this very simple setup? And those unitary matrices are shown here in the left. And you can see that while they are not completely general, they are not, uh, they're not sparse. So actually about two thirds of the elements in the unitary matrix are non-zero. So I can generate this very complicated entanglement between the squeeze states if I can if I have access to this setup. Um, right, so we're gonna focus from now on in this setup in the 666 circuit, the circuit that is a three dimensional lattice where each uh, lattice dimension has dimension six. And then what I want to add now is that for that, for those dimensions, it's going to be really hard for a classical adversary to, to simulate it. So how will a classical adversary go about simulating these types of circuits? Well, the first option is uh, this adversary could calculate all the probabilities that happen in the circuit. They could, this adversary could store them in memory, and then they could just roll a gigantic die that has the right biases related to these probabilities, but obviously that's gonna scale really poorly. It's gonna scale really poorly because one, we know that calculated even one of those probabilities is extremely hard, and two, because there are combinatorially many of those probabilities. So that is not a viable approach. And luckily people have thought about better approaches, so I'm gonna summarize those here. So for standard boson sampling, so when you send single photons into an interferometer, uh, Arons and Arkhipov are that this, the probability of a certain outcome is proportional to the permanent of a matrix that has a size that is given by the number of photons that are detected. And then we know from the 60s that the, for the calculation of a permanent, you're gonna require of the order of two to the n uh, steps where n is again the size of the matrix. So, so that's gonna scale poorly in terms of the number of photons but this is just to calculate probabilities. But recently, uh, well, not so recently, maybe within the last five years, um, Alex Neville and a number of people from Bristol and then later uh, Raphael and Peter Clifford showed that actually the complexity of generating samples is actually almost identical to the complexity of calculating these probability amplitudes. So, so the amount of time that I have to run in a computer to generate one of these strings of where the photons landed is exactly the same time that I require to calculate, or roughly the same time that I require to calculate one of the probability amplitudes that that event actually occurred. Now, for boson sampling, there is a similar situation where now the probability of a certain uh, photon number outcome is proportional to this other quantity called the Hafnian that I will not try to explain what it does, but what I can tell you is that if the Hafnian of a matrix of size n by n is what appears there, then the complexity of calculating that Hafnian goes like two to the n by two. And this is a result by, by Andreas Bjorklund. So what we're gonna assume now is that this parallel exists also between samples and probability and, and probability amplitudes for the case of Gaussian boson sampling. So we're gonna assume that a classical adversary will require about a, a time that is proportional to the complexity of calculating a sample for simulating one of those samples. So we write here order two to the n by two, but actually to, to give you a precise estimate, actually I need to write what is the time without this approximation of order two to the n by two. So for that, we can benchmark how long it takes to calculate uh, one of these happenings in a supercomputer. So we did it in Niagara, which is the largest supercomputer in Canada, and we did it up to sizes uh, 84 by 84. And those are the, the orange stars that you see there. And based on that, we can uh, extrapolate and actually obtain that the correct complexity goes like a constant times n cubed times two, to, times two to the n by two. And then we can obtain that that constant is some number in Niagara, and then we can convert the number in Niagara, which is this supercomputer that we 
that we did this benchmark, and we're going to convert it into Fugaku, which is the largest supercomputer in the world. So for Fugaku, we find that that constant is on the order of 10 to the negative 17 seconds. So now we have a scaling law. So now we know exactly how long it's going to take for an adversary to calculate one of those probability amplitudes. We can then ask, so on average, how long it's going to take? And this is an extra degree of complexity because now recall that in Gaussian boson sampling, the total photon number is actually a random variable. And, and for that, we can calculate what is the distribution of the total photon number. So here it is. We can first calculate it for the case where there is no loss. And you can see that, for instance, for the 666 circuit that I mentioned before, and if you input a, a mean photon number of 0 0.8 in each of the channels of the interferometer, you're going to get that the mean photon number is peak around 180, and it has the distribution that you see there. Now, if you allow for loss, obviously, that implies that the distribution of photon numbers shifts downwards, and it also becomes narrow. And in particular, if you set 3 dB of loss, which is roughly what we expect by building an interferometer with the loops that I show you, you see that now the distribution is picked around 85 photons right here. And we can now calculate what is actually the runtime by simply taking the probability of having this many photons and, and multiplying by the time it will take to calculate that probability. And then we're going to allow for an overhead of a factor of 100 between calculating probability amplitudes and in generating samples. So doing that, we find that the time that it will take on average to generate one of these samples will be on the order of a year. You know, it's around 10 to the 7 seconds. And this we can compare with the, the clock rate that one of these devices could have. And that clock rate is, um, is about microseconds. So we see a, a difference of about 14 orders of magnitude or 13 orders of magnitude um, in speed. So we have, we have benchmarked this, and we see that there is a, a gigantic gap in the speed between classical, um, and classical supercomputers and the quantum machine that we could, that we could generate. So, so now I, I'll come to the end. So this is our, our preprint that we put in, in February in the archive, in which we introduce a new high dimensional programmable GPS architecture. And this is very important. This is a computer in the sense that you can actually give it a program and ask it to execute it. It's not just a fixed machine that cannot change. Um, a second point is that because of the way it's structured, because we use this idea of high dimensional um, boson sampling, the, the loss doesn't accrue exponentially with the, with the problem size. It accrues sub-exponentially. Um, and for these particular numbers that I show you, we can have about 216 modes with 3 dB loss, and it's going to be far beyond the capabilities of any classical adversary. Finally, there are two things that I didn't have to mention. One is that we also, in the preprint, in improve the complexity theoretic evidence that GBS is hard. So instead of you know doing benchmarking of supercomputers, we actually have all these nice theorems and well-supported conjectures arguing that GBS, even in this regime of high-dimensional GBS, should be hard to simulate, and that no one will be able to come up with a with a classically efficient algorithm to simulate it. And, and I think with that, I'd like to conclude. And thanks to the organizers for the invitation.